This podcast is sponsored by Andrea and Stephen Mayle in honor of their beloved mothers, Carol Schlippack and Zelda Mayle. This is The Book of Life, a podcast that uncovers life lessons from Judaism's most important book, helping you power your day with purpose. Here is Ruchi Koval. Every Friday night at Shabbat dinner, we go around the table and share different ideas, usually prompted by a question from my husband or me. So one Friday night, our guests had just come back from a trip to Israel, and we were going around the table sharing impressions of our journeys to Israel. Our youngest daughter, Nomi, who was then eight years old, she said with this, like, indignation, it's not fair. I'm already eight years old, and I've never gone to Israel in my whole entire life. Look, the land of Israel is exceptionally special, right? It's filled with wonder and history and innovation and Jewish pride. The wind blows spirituality. The air is sweeter. The sky is bluer. The vegetables are more ripe and fresh in the land of Israel. So Nomi definitely had a point. But I shared with her that night that I did not go to Israel for the first time until I was 18 years old. And that was for a full year of study without any visits home. And even that was pretty spoiled. I mean, throughout our history, there have been so many rabbis and scholars and leaders who have really tried to get to the land of Israel, only to be frustrated at every turn. Travel was difficult. Anti-Semitism was rife. There was politics that conspired against us. The land of Israel then was not what it is today. It was a desert that hadn't bloomed yet. It was very hard to get to Israel. But it's not only Nomi and our leaders throughout history who have been unable to make the pilgrimage. Our greatest leader and teacher of all time, Moses, was not allowed to enter the land of Israel, the land toward which he had guided the Jewish people for 40 years. Why wasn't Moses allowed to enter Israel? So the Torah describes various mistakes that Moses made in his 40-year term of leadership that unfortunately invalidated him from entering Israel. And it's still actually really difficult to understand. He had worked his whole life to serve this people by bringing them out of the land of slavery and home to their promised land, a land flowing with milk and honey. So how could it be that at the very end, it wasn't meant to be? In the Torah this week, God invites Moses to step up to the mountain, overlooking Israel so that although he can't go into the land, at least he can get a glimpse of this promised land that he'd been traveling toward. What's Moses' reaction to being denied this prize for which he'd worked so hard? So we see this fascinating dichotomy in his attitude, and I think that this can hopefully teach us how to handle situations that we too are grieving or how to handle disappointment when our own prayers go unanswered. So on the one hand, we see that Moses ultimately accepts his fate and he doesn't argue with God. But on the other hand, We're told that Moses prayed hundreds of times to be allowed into the land of Israel until God finally shuts down his prayer and tells him that enough is enough. In my experience, I have found this balance to be excruciatingly difficult because when we pray from the depths of our being for something that we want or need so badly, right? I mean, isn't it by definition an expression of non-acceptance? right? Isn't prayer telling God and yourself that you refuse to accept your fate, right? That you're challenging your fate, that you're challenging God? Because if you accepted it, then why would you pray? I mean, how could you even pray with passion if you really accepted it? But all the while that we're praying with passion, you can't, we can't live our lives expecting things to change on a dime, If we don't have acceptance, then we don't have serenity, and and we don't have peace of mind. How can you live your life constantly waiting for it to change? That's no life. The famed serenity prayer from Alcoholics Anonymous asks for the serenity to accept the things we cannot change, the courage to change the things we can, and the wisdom to know the difference. But, I mean, truthfully, we often don't know the difference. God is not talking to us to let us know when to shut down prayer mode and enter acceptance mode. So it's often not clear to us what we can and cannot change. Prayer is very powerful and it can change worlds. 
but we have no way of knowing which prayer God is going to answer yes to and which prayer God is going to say no to. So in some way, we all have to live this duality. So when we stand before God in prayer, we're not taking no for an answer, right? We're begging and pleading and arguing with God that things can and must change. But it's impossible and deeply unsatisfying to live life like always hoping it will be different. So to have peace of mind, we need to accept what is. So the moment I step away from prayer, I try to have serenity in my heart to accept things the way they are. Please know that I share these ideas with you as a note of advice to myself as well. It's really hard to handle this like conflicted mindset, right? Do I hope, pray, and wait for life's problems to change? Or do I accept what is with humility and silence? I think that in order to maximize our lives, we can reach for the stars in our hopes and prayers, asking God for everything, all while accepting what is in front of us. Because, you know, we all have areas of our lives in which our prayers have not been answered. We all have certain areas of deprivation. Some of us don't have good health. Some don't have a life partner and would like to meet one. Some don't have children and are praying for that. Some are struggling with financial stability. Some have parenting struggles. I mean, we all have areas in which we need God to answer our prayers. But sometimes we're so busy asking God for specific requests that We don't even notice all the prayers that he's already answered because sometimes accepting what is opens our eyes to the blessings all around us, which is why Jewish prayer always includes gratitude and praise to God and not just requests. And Jewish prayer also includes specific requests because there will always be things to pray for. And last year, our daughter Nomi, who was then nine, went to Israel her prayers were answered. Now, of course, she has new prayers, new things she's asking us and God for. Because kids don't take no for an answer. Do we? Should we? This is The Book of Life. Don't forget to rate, review, and subscribe to Momentum Podcasts on Apple, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. Join Ruchi again next time for more meaning and inspiration from Judaism's most important book to power your day with purpose. You're listening to a Momentum Podcast. For unlimited inspiration, wisdom, and empowerment, visit MomentumUnlimited.org.